November 3rd, 2020. You know what's gonna happen that day? Our next national election. How does that make you feel? Excited, excited or sickened, you know? Optimistic or pessimistic? Today we're going to talk about an ancient message to a world very much like ours.
So ready or not, it's coming. November 3rd, 2020, okay? The next national election, it, it'll prove to be probably a historic one. The nation's divided. It, it's just, it's making some people sick to their stomachs thinking about what might be coming. Other people are optimistic and, and some are completely pessimistic. It, the world is just all over the place. And, and uh, there are always people who trend towards pessimism. And then there's always those people that will go dig in the, the big pile of poo, looking, 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 because they think they're, with all this poo and manure, there must be a pony in there somewhere, you know? And, and, uh, but it's no secret that many, many people in our country today have lost confidence in where our country is headed. They, and they don't believe that a new election will change that. And that growing lack of confidence has been around actually for a while now. As a matter of fact, Back six years ago, there was a Gallup poll done in 2014 that tested Americans' confidence in the three branches of the U.S. government. It, it, they saw back in 2014 that confidence in the Supreme Court was only 30%. Congress, arousing 7% of the population, felt like they could be trusted to do a good job. And the presidency fell to a six-year low of 29% of confidence. Parallel to that, the Washington Post citing a 2014 Wall Street Journal NBC News poll asked this question, life for our children, what's it gonna be like for the next generation? Are they gonna do better than we have done? A fully 76% said that they do not have that confidence back in 2014. In 2001, nearly half the population still had an optimistic view about where the future was going. And the gloom is worse today, I think, you know, and the gloom goes beyond people of wealth, it goes beyond gender, race, region, age, and ideology. Our divided nation is united by one thing, a lot of people have lost hope in our system. Um, but this morning, I, I want to remind you, it's all going to change, right? Just like it did before. Here it comes, the election, November 3rd, 2020, you know, it's going to turn around on that day, right? Don't worry. Not buying that? Well, the bigger narrative, I believe what's going on in our world is this. The United States has moved from the post-World War II boom of optimism, okay, into this current era of pessimism. We have a pandemic, we have civil unrest, we have resurgent racism, we have an economic um, challenge, we have an educational crisis right at our door, in the West, we have record heat and a crazy amount of wildfires. And, and the question becomes, where do you turn when your optimism dies? You know, where do you turn when your world feels like it's just completely falling apart? What I want to do today is I want to look at an ancient example for an answer. You see, a similar situation occurred to Israel, in Israel in the 8th century BC. It's recorded for us in the book of Isaiah, and in it we find an ancient message to a modern world. Like our times, 8th century BC world that Isaiah lived in was built on optimistic sweat, hope, and dreams, okay? But Isaiah's world changed, just like our world has changed. As a child, he lived in a world that was peaceful and prosperous. There was a guy named Uzziah who'd been king for 52 years. Think about that, 52 years. To give you an idea how long that is, you have to think about how many presidents we've had since 1968. You had Donald Trump, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon. You have to go all the way back to Lyndon Johnson. That's how long Uzziah ruled. Now, opinions about those presidents are all over the map, depending on your political perspective. But Uzziah was competent and trusted. He was the only king that most people had known. He'd become king of Israel when he was only 16 years old, and he was greatly liked by the people, and he was an outstanding leader. Uzziah was a military genius and innovator. He established a standing army of, we think, 300,000 people. He built machines of war that could shoot just masses of arrows and large rocks. And under his leadership, the Philistines were finally defeated. And what that did was it caused the other enemies of the region to kiss up to him because they, they saw what he had done, what he, had, what he accomplished. 
He engaged in large-scale building projects and civil engineering projects that brought security to Jerusalem through, through, through the building of defensive structures. He secured water and he brought food security to the country as well. He was a technological innovator and an economic wizard. For most of his world, his rule as well, he was squared away as a spiritual leader as well. He had a mentor who instructed him and trained him to follow the Lord. He had a moral compass. And truthfully, eventually some of his accomplishments had kind of gave him a big and prideful head. And eventually he tended to believe some of his own press reports and he lost some boundaries later in his life. And, and so like a lot of noteworthy people, he had some personal failings that made the end of his life kind of difficult. But that didn't, invent, it didn't affect the average person in the kingdom very much. Generally, under his 52 years of leadership, the nation prospered and the people of Israel felt a sense of security. The affairs of their nation were being taken care of by a guy who knew what he was doing and could be trusted to deal with whatever issues came up. They felt secure under his leadership. And for most of them, he was the only king they had ever known. But like our world today, the wheels fell off, okay? The peaceful and prosperous ride they'd been on got wrecked. The times changed like they do. And the world people had gotten used to was different. And it was a hard adjustment for a lot of people. And the book makes it clear that these challenges were actually all part of God's plan. In chapter one of Isaiah, the book begins with God's evaluation of the spiritual state of the people. They were prosperous and generally religious, okay? But like the United States during our period of extreme growth and prosperity, the Israelites had a fundamental flaw. They had forgotten that although they owned much, they were also actually owned by God. And they failed to live with inner devotion that was true. They, this, this passion for God thing had been kind of, had kind of weaned out of their lives. And, and, they, and, and, and especially a kind of love for God, they found practical expression in showing compassion towards other people. And so God evaluated them and found them wanting. In chapter two, it talks about a day that eventually at the end of the day, a day is coming when God will eventually push this issue and reestablish his complete control of his good earth. And when the day of the Lord comes, it says, our silly philosophies, possessions, our pride and all this stuff will be exposed for what it really is, just a godless idolatry. Chapter three predicts that, predicted that God was going to bring a fundamental change that they were experiencing, that he was gonna bring a fundamental change to the world the people grew up in and had been accustomed to, like so many of us are finding we need to adjust to. This prediction is pretty much summed up in the opening line of chapter three when it says, the Lord is about to take away from society all supply and support. In other words, the idea is the wheels are just gonna fall off. That supply and support in the Latin translations of the Bible are vigorum et vim, which we would say in English, vim and vigor. The idea is, is the enthusiasm and the energy that drove this society and this economy and this political system was just gonna, the wheels were gonna fall off it. And the Lord was gonna make human society not work very well anymore. He was gonna knock out all the supports. And, and, and Isaiah's society experienced that. They lost their vim and vigor. And so was ours in many ways. Only the meaning here is more intense than, it's not just describing a mood. The Lord made it so that a lot of the basic infrastructure, food, law and order, security, and all that kind of stuff was jeopardized. Then what follows in the next couple chapters of Isaiah's book are continued descriptions about how God is going to reestablish his control over his good world, that ultimately he's the owner that ultimately he's the one that's going to be in charge, okay? The language is vivid, it's filled with imagery that describes the great love that God has for his people, but then there are continued refrains that, that this counterpoint of jar, harsh judgment is going to come because the people had failed to do right, what, was in, what the right things were in God's eyes when it came to true heartfelt devotion to God 
and showing true compassion and love to their fellow man. And then comes an event that changes Isaiah's life. It happens in chapter six. It contains this incredible moment in Isaiah's journey. It's an encounter with God that changed his life forever. Isaiah's encounter with God coincided with the death of Uzziah, a, a defining moment for the nation and a defining moment for the prophet Isaiah. It says this in chapter six, verse one, the year that King Isaiah died and what died with him was peace and prosperity. It doesn't happen all at once, but the wheels begin to wobble and the wheels are going to fall off. It's gonna usher in a new era. As surely as 9-11 rushed in a new era for us and, and, and the financial crisis of 2000, or 2008. The wheels fell off the peaceful, prosperous ride that the nation had enjoyed. You see, Isaiah represented stability, prosperity, peace, and optimism. Under King Isaiah, Isaiah himself prospered. He enjoyed wealth. He, he got a good education, and he was a family man. He was married to, to a woman, and they had two boys together. But with the death of Isaiah, Isaiah's life changed dramatically. With his death, Isaiah's service to the nation as a spokesperson for God began really in earnest. Isaiah ended up speaking God's words to the people for 44 years, which means he was a long haul kind of guy. And, and, and during that time, he experienced four different kings and, and that, that had risen up after Isaiah passed away. To help Isaiah fulfill his assignment, okay, God gives Isaiah an insight into the way the world really works. In the midst of the political change that was going on with Isaiah's death, the, the death of peace and prosperity, God reminds Isaiah that there actually is someone who's competent, who's still on the throne. Isaiah needed that reminder, just like we do today. God rem reminds Isaiah that someone is still on the throne. It's an important message for us today. Someone is still in charge. So God shows Isaiah how things really hang. Okay, what he does is he tears back the curtain of time and space and gives him into an insight into the way things really are, who really is in charge of what's going on. And the descriptions are fantastic and they're figurative. Okay, and the experience becomes the defining moment of Isaiah's life. It says in, in, in chapter six, verse one, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. God gives Isaiah a vision of who he really is. King Uzziah had died, but the Lord was still on the throne. The description goes on, it says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on his throne, and the train, the, the flow of his robe filled the temple. Okay? And above him were these like creatures, these, these angelic creatures, these seraphim, they're called. Each of them had six wings. Okay, these are fantastic descriptions. And with two wings, they covered their faces because they were in the presence of God. With two, they covered their feet because they were on holy ground. And with two, they were flying and hovering there. And they were calling one to another. They were calling to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is his. The whole earth is full of his glory. And at the sound of their voices, the whole place started shaking. The doorposts and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And in this experience, Isaiah gains a clear understanding of the transcendent, wonderful, pure, and holy God that sits on the throne. And, 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 and this, mis, this displaces any hope that he might have had on a human leader. Misplaced hope in a, in a human leader is never a good idea. And, and so what God does for Isaiah is he, 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 he displaces the hope that he put in this human leader and he, and he replaces it with the hope of the one who ultimately is the one sitting on the throne. And when he sees all this and he experiences all this, Isaiah looks at himself. In the next verse it says, woe is me, woe is me. I am, I am undone, I am ruined, okay? Because I am a man 
who is not pure. I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people who have unclean lips. But now my eyes have seen the king, the one who's really in charge, the Lord Almighty. The vision clarifies for Isaiah how he fits into the scheme of things. That he's, and, and what he realizes is that when, when he's confronted with God's transcendence and his purity, that he's guilty and he sees his failings right in front of him. But God does something for Isaiah. He forgives his sin and relieves his guilt. And here's how he did it. He said, one of the seraphim flew to me and took a live coal, okay, which, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar and he touched these unclean lips. He touched my mouth and he, and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So Isaiah gets a fresh start, a new vision, a fresh start, a cleansing to be able to go out and do something super important. Because next what God makes it, God makes it clear that he needs somebody in, this, in, this, in his world to represent him, to speak for him so that others could receive what Isaiah had received as well. Then I heard a voice, the little voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah volunteers for the job. He says, here I am. He says, send me. So God appoints Isaiah and send him, sends him out as his representative. And it's not an easy job, okay? He has to deliver a lot of unpopular and harsh sometimes information to a bunch of people who really don't want to hear it, okay? And, and, but it also involves a message of hope. You know, put your trust where it belongs, where, 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 where it's worthy of. And, and the content of Isaiah's message is given to us in this book, okay? And the message is, is towards a, directed towards a society that was experiencing kind of like what we're experiencing in our own world. And it's a timeless message. And the message is summed up really simply, and it's in Isaiah's name. The meaning of Isaiah's name gets, gets, gets complete, continually brought out Throughout the, throughout the messages that he brings. And what, it, what Isaiah's me, name means is Yahweh saves, which means the Lord saves. Today, people are looking for salvation, okay? They're looking for, sal for salvation for an economic system, okay? They're looking for salvation from a, for a political system. They're looking for salvation for a government, okay? But the message of Isaiah is the Lord saves, but who he saves is he saves people, no matter what their political persuasion is, no matter what government and what system of government they live under, no matter what economic system they buy into, it matters not. He's interested in each and every individual. He wants to save them. And, and here's the thing, he is not the savior of a particular economic system. He is not the savior of a, of a particular political party or something like that. He is not the savior of a, of a certain kind of governmental system or something like that. No, he cares about people who live under all of those systems and all of those ideologies. It makes no difference. I want you to think about something. What, what is it that keeps you up at night? You know, what do you worry about? You know, is it a concern about, you know, the, the, the shifting political situation in the world? Is it, you know, where the next terrorist strike is gonna, is gonna come from? Is it the diagnosis maybe that you received or the, the costs of, of your medical care? You know, um, uh, do, you, do you wonder how could you possibly ever retire? You know, um, um, are you gonna, how are you gonna replace that junker you drive, you know? Um, how are you gonna get out from underneath that pile of debt? Or how are you gonna make next month's rent or mortgage payment, you know? Whatever it is that you worry about, these fears and uncertainties are meant to draw you to a bigger place, to a bigger concern. And, and, and it's this, where am I at with the one who's ultimately in charge? The one who holds my eternity in my hands? I worry about all these temporal things, but where am I at with the big picture, okay? We have a pandemic, we have civil unrest, we have resurgent racism, we have economic challenges, and ec a potential ec um, educational crisis we're dealing with. We have record heat, we have wildfires, and these are meant to push us 
They're, they're, they're there to help us return and get reoriented to the one who ultimately holds our eternity in his hands, the one who ultimately is in charge, the one who Isaiah saw, the one who sits on the throne. And all these concerns have to do with the, that we, that we carry around with us, have to do with the temporary short lives that we've been given. But our fears are meant to draw us a certain place. I think we push our fears away a lot by arguing and by, by coming up with the conspiracy behind it or, or, or all this kind of stuff, and, we, and it makes us fail to deal with the real issue, okay? The real issue is we are all temporary creatures in this world. Our fears are meant to lead us to a conclusion that we gotta get it right with the one who planted us here, that the maker loves us and he wants to live in relationship with us. And he wants to touch our lips. He wants to touch our souls and, ex and, and relieve our guilt and give us salvation, give us forgiveness, okay? That all these things are meant to point us to the one who sits on the throne and to put our hope in him, not in the human solutions, but to the Lord Almighty for whom, um, who, who will never let us down. Would you pray with me? Lord, like you said to the prophet Isaiah, you say to those of us who have trusted in Jesus, you say, our guilt is taken away. Our sin is atoned for. And we thank you for that hope and that promise. And you asked Isaiah the same question you ask each one of us. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Lord, give us the willingness, give us the courage, give us the clarity to join Isaiah in saying, here I am, send me. Lord, we know that that's not an easy job to, to point people in, in your direction because sometimes it involves the delivery of, of unpopular information to a bunch of people who don't want to hear it. But it's the only message that makes sense. It's this message of hope. The Lord is on the throne. The Lord saves. Lord, we thank you that you don't save economic, social, or political systems. No, you save the human beings that you love, who you made and created in a special way that we would exist within your good world. You are the maker and you wanna, you wanna bring your love into every human life. Lord, we make ourselves avail available to you to make that happen in our sphere of influence. Here I am, Lord, send me. Thanks for being with us today. Um, it's, it's been great to you know, virtually be with you. Hopefully soon we're gonna be able to start meeting again face to face. Uh, we are meeting in, in, in Adams Park on, on, at 5 o'clock on, on Sunday nights. Hope you can join us there. We have a really nice, cool place, a green grass, shady trees and all. And, and uh, we are starting up our tutoring program to help these distance learning students. And, and, the, and the enrollment is growing and, and it's really exciting because we really hope we can make a difference in the lives of these kids. If you need help, please contact us at rcbc.life. We'd love to help you in any way we can. And, and, and please, we also do need your support. Thank you for the way you've been faithfully supporting our church. We pray that you continue. But let us know if, we, if you need help in any way. God bless. At Ridgeview Church, I'm glad you were here today and hope you enjoyed our online service. My name's Jesse and I'm one of the pastors here. I also wanna let you know that we meet each Sunday night in person at Adams Park at 5 p.m. It's a great time of worship, uh, a little word from Pastor Bill and a, and a time of fellowship as well. So I hope you can join us in person as well as online each Sunday. Have a blessed day.
Together for my 